how to improve on classical guitar. I'm glad to have you with me today for the stream and we'll go ahead and dive in. A uh, question that I received in advance was from Alan McCarthy about how to play hemiola in music. And hemiola is basically when you have a piece that may be written in 3-4, uh, but sometimes it sounds like 6-8. Uh, so 6-8 has two groups of three uh, eighth notes. 3-4 typically has three groups of two eighth notes. Uh, so one of the stereotypical examples of this is the song I Wanna Live in America from West Side Story. And the rhythm is basically, I want to live in America, I want to live in America. You know, that is the sort of switching back and forth between the 3-4 feel and uh, the 6-8 feel. And so one of the examples in classical guitar repertoire of Hemiola is the piece Canarios by Gaspar Sanz. And um, I'll play just a little excerpt. So. You know, so again, it's that switching. Here's the 6-8 feel. And that's the 3-4 measure. So switching back and forth between a 6-8 feel and a 3-4 feel, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, and 2, and 3, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, and 2, and 3, and that is a hemiola. Uh, so if you have other questions about hemiola, uh, let me know. But uh, that is a little uh, answer to Alan's question on hemiola. Uh, Steve Purnell says, nail the nail controversy, uh, and uh, that's uh, an interesting way to put it. Uh, so there's a long-standing controversy, should you play classical guitar with nails or not? Uh, I will say for modern classical guitar, I like nails, but yeah, it's been a controversy back to the days of lute. There were lute treatises that talked about not using nails, uh, but then there were some that talked about using nails, especially on Theorbo, the big arch lute, you know, with the long strings. You'd have higher uh, tension on the strings then, and using nails was more appropriate. For the smaller lutes, uh, a lot of times they would use just the flesh of the fingertips. So uh, for modern classical guitar, I like nails, but sure, there are plenty of people that play with flesh. If you're going to use nails, think about the length, shape, and smoothness. Um, you know, nail about a sixteenth of an inch past the end of the fingertip is what I recommend. Uh, it can be a little longer with the thumb. Uh, the shape, uh, sort of a rounded ramp shape, and uh, the smoothness, I usually smooth it with a 500 grain per square inch sandpaper. Uh, if you break a nail, then sometimes you can use an artificial nail. So, um, if you uh, are uh, here for the stream, and I see several of you, Voyage, Jonathan Laird, WW, uh, Darshan, Daniel Smith, uh, glad you guys all made it. And uh, thanks for making it over to the different stream after I had audio issues the first go round. And so um, another question that I got in advance was from Motorbike Ray. And his question was, if you wanna practice uh, guitar late at night without bothering people, how do you do that? And so what I would suggest is actually putting a piece of cloth in the strings. Uh, you can actually put a piece of cloth down under your strings. Um, I meant to grab this before I started the stream. One second. So you just take a piece of cloth like this and you put it under the strings. And then if you're playing late at night, you know, I've done this in hotel rooms when I was traveling for a performance, uh, but also, you know, if you have roommates or a spouse or somebody else that doesn't want to hear you playing at 11 o'clock at night, you can just put a piece of cloth in the strings and then you start playing. It's extremely quiet. So that is a good way um, in answer to Motorbike Ray's question uh, to be able to play late at night without bothering people. Uh, just put a piece of cloth into the strings. Uh, so good question from Motorbike Ray. If others of you have a question, please do drop that in the chat and I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat. And uh, I see Bill says, I love you smart classical guitar. Awesome, Bill, thank you. And Voyage says you could buy a Yamaha silent guitar. Uh, certainly an option. Yeah, there's the Yamaha silent guitar. There's also a product called a Soloette that just looks like a silhouette of a guitar. It doesn't actually have the body of the guitar. And you can kind of plug it into headphones and hear yourself playing. Same concept with the Yamaha silent guitar. Um, so it is possible to buy um, a guitar that's basically made for this purpose, where there's no external sound and you can plug in headphones and just hear yourself play. Um, so that's, that's another good option for playing late at night. Uh, so thank you, Voyage, for bringing that up. Um, Bluesy Bluesman had a question. If you had to choose between recommending pure technique practice and guitar etudes to improve technique, uh, how would you, uh, what would you recommend? 
And I'm really glad I don't have to choose because I find that just playing scales and arpeggio exercises is very useful and playing etudes, you know, Carcassi etudes, Sor etudes, Villalobos etudes, Giuliani, etc. I find that etudes are very useful too. If I had to choose, then I guess I would choose the etudes. Uh, in other words, because they are a piece of music, you know, you can practice more of the expressive side with an etude than you can with just a scale exercise. Um, so if I had to choose, I'd choose etudes, but I'm really glad to be able to use both. Uh, so thank you for that question, uh, Bluesy Blues Man. And then uh, Jonathan Laird had sent in a question in advance that was about the position of the right hand wrist. And he talks about he's playing a Giuliani Opus, 8, or Opus 48 number five, and he gets a slight scraping sound on the bases. And his wrist is straight when he plays. Um, he wonders if his uh, you know, hand is at too much of an angle to the strings. Well, uh, there's a couple things I would say here. First of all, yes, if you're at a, at a steep angle to the strings, you're gonna tend to get kind of a scraping noise. And I'll move the mic a little bit so maybe you can um, see my right hand a little better, but, um, but you definitely will tend to get a scraping sound if you're coming across the strings. So you need to pluck more at a right angle to the string uh, to get less of that scraping sound. Now, with that said, um, having a straight wrist is the most ergonomic. In other words, it's the most healthy for your joint and for your tendons to have a straight wrist. So I do not recommend that you make a curved wrist your default, which was kind of another part of what Jonathan wrote was, hey, should I just have a curved wrist all the time? No, I would not recommend having a curved wrist all the time. I think it's actually better uh, to have a straight wrist. But uh, what I would... Uh, what I'd recommend is, you know, if you're playing something and normally you're playing on the trebles with your index and middle fingers, then having the straight wrist is great. Being a little bit of an angle to the string is just fine. But when you get to the bases, you know, maybe you can curve your wrist a little bit there. Um, Jonathan also asked, you know, does it help with speed to have your right hand wrist curve so you're attacking straight or across? Well, the idea there is, uh, you know, if people say, hey, you can play faster if you play straight across the string, the idea is that you'll go through the string quicker, whereas if you're plucking oblique, you know, there's a little bit more resistance, a little bit more slide across the string before you get through. So the idea is, you know, hey, maybe if you're playing straight or across, you can play quicker. Well, personally, I like a little bit of an oblique angle with the trebles. I like how it kind of warms up the tone. So for me, I play more oblique on the trebles and then a little straighter on on the basses to avoid the scraping sound. Um, but also, you can play around with the overall angle of the guitar. If you want to play straighter across the string, you can just make a steeper neck angle and your hand will naturally go straighter through the string without you having to curve the wrist too much. But I would just be careful about curving the wrist too much because we don't want to create uh, any wrist problems, tendon problems, or things like that. Um, I see Daniel says, uh, back when you were an early intermediate, did you find it somewhat frustrating to coordinate your fingers and how much time did you practice? Uh, well, certainly coordinating the fingers is a challenge. And uh, when I was, uh, I guess what you describe as early intermediate, uh, then I was practicing two or three hours a day. I got pretty serious about the guitar pretty quickly. And so within my first year of playing, I got to the point I was playing two or three hours a day and kind of kept at it uh, for a number of years after that. So, um, so yeah, I was putting in a lot of time on the guitar. And um, did I get frustrated with the coordination? Certainly. I certainly found that things like practicing scales are a great way to coordinate. You know, just really making sure that each time your right hand and left hand move, that you're moving the two together and uh, synchronizing them. So I would say slow practice on scales or something of that nature would be a really good way um, to make sure that you coordinate uh, the hands. So thank you, Daniel, for that question. I see Darshan says a slur tip. Well, slurs, you know, when you're thinking about hammer-ons and pull-offs, um, you know, a hammer-on, I typically think of a quick focused movement for the hammer-on. A pull-off, I think of like plucking the string and pulling into the adjacent string. Um, so, uh, so my tip would be when you're doing the hammer-ons, just kind of a quick focused attack. When you're doing the pull-offs, in general, I want to pull sideways into the adjacent string. I find that to be really helpful for pull-offs. Uh, so thank you, uh, Darshan, for that question. If you have other questions, uh, do put those in the chat. And uh, another question that I received in advance was from John Rosler, 
And uh, he said he plays guitar in a church setting and with a small worship band. Sometimes he's asked to play solo instrumental. And he's wondering about uh, what books could he use for um, guitar arrangements for uh, hymns. And he's asking, you know, are there any that have tabs? Well, actually, I play in church a lot, so I have a lot of books um, that I use for this. So I'm going to run through these really quickly. And if you're interested in this topic, you can you know, watch the replay back and kind of see the ones I'm going to show. But I'm going to go through them quickly because I realize not everybody's looking for him arrangements for church. But it's something, again, that I've done a lot of. Uh, so here's this book, Favorite Hymns uh, for Solo Guitar. This one does have tab. And this is one that's at a fairly you know, early intermediate slash advanced beginner stage. Not too, too difficult. Uh, so this is a really nice book. This is from uh, Hal Leonard, Favorite Hymns for Solo Guitar. Uh, so that's one that I've used. Another one is Favorite Hymns for Acoustic Guitar by Rick Foster. This is from Mel Bay. Uh, this one does have tab as well. Another one is Eternal Guitar by Rick Foster. Also uh, has tab as well, also from Mel Bay. Uh, then there are some that's kind of more contemporary praise and worship. Praise and worship favorites for easy level guitar from Word Music has tab. And then finger picking praise from Hal Leonard um, that also has tab as well. Then some of my favorites actually don't have tab. Uh, you know, kind of purist classical guitarists don't always play with tab. So um, Hymns and Sacred Melodies by Gerard Garneau. I think it's out of print now. Uh, but you can still occasionally find a copy online. This is one of my absolute favorites. I've played a lot of hymn arrangements out of this one. Um, another one, there's a guy named Mark Cruz from Texas. Uh, Hymnity, he has a volume one and volume two. Um, I don't think I have the volume two, but I have his volume one of Hymnity. That's good uh, for hymns. Uh, then another one I've done, uh, also without tab, is Favorite Hymns for Classical Guitar from Mel Bay. And a couple more. I've got Hymn Collection for Solo Classical Guitar by Gary Lowry. Also doesn't have tab, but another good uh, book of hymn arrangements. And then Christopher Parkening has Sacred Music for the Guitar, uh, Volume 1, and he also has a Volume 2. So uh, I've got tons and tons of arrangements for uh, classical guitar hymns. So if that's an interest to you, hopefully that helps. And again, I, I know it went kind of quick. You can go back to the replay uh, for the names of some of those. Uh, Daniel says, what was your first uh, full score classical attempt? Well, I think the first piece I remember playing in public was Green Sleeves out of the Parkin and Guitar Method Volume 1. And so I guess you could call that my first full score classical attempt was Green Sleeves, if that counts. Um, but I would say in general, the Parkin and Guitar Method Volume 1 was kind of the first uh, classical repertoire that I played. Uh, WW says, any tips on injury prevention? I heard they're pretty common among professionals. Yeah, absolutely. Injuries definitely do happen to guitarists who play a lot. I had a, a very difficult bout with tendonitis when I was in graduate school as a, a master's of music student. And uh, I thought for a while I was going to have to give up on guitar teaching and playing as a career. So, yeah, the biggest thing is making sure you're playing with good technique, you know, straight wrists, curved fingers, things like that. You know, you don't want the wrist too curved. This puts a lot of strain on the joints and the tendons and things like that. So uh, just ergonomic, you know, comfortable sitting position, comfortable wrist position, comfortable hand position, uh, not having a lot of excess tension when you play. Uh, taking frequent breaks helps, you know, taking a break every 15 to 30 minutes um, is a good thing, you know, standing up, stretching, walking around, and just being aware of pain. If your arms start hurting while you're playing, notice that, um, and be aware that there may be things outside of guitar playing that are causing injuries as well. So could be if you're doing a bunch of video games or a bunch of typing on a laptop, uh, that maybe that's putting strain on your wrist and forearms as well. Uh, so just kind of, you know, thinking about those activities and, you know, maybe I need to take some breaks in those activities or do less of uh, my video games for a while or something uh, so that I'm not putting too much strain on my arms and hands. So a uh, good question there from WW. Uh, Skeet Joystick says, I just started using a metronome. My practicing is so much more efficient. Awesome. Yeah, a metronome is such a great tool. Uh, I always try to tell students a metronome is your friend. And I realize not all students believe me when I say that to them, and you may not believe me on that, but a metronome really is your friend. And so Skeet Joystick, I'm glad that you are seeing the benefits of using the metronome. It really just is a great tool to determine, you know, hey, am I playing at the tempo I meant to play? Am I playing in the rhythm correctly? And so, yeah, I'm a big advocate for the usefulness of the metronome in practice, uh, for sure. 
And Darshan says, I didn't know I needed this, but thanks, uh, these hymn books were helpful. So cool. I'm glad that you found it helpful, Darshan. And again, I've, I've played lots and lots of uh, hymn and sacred arrangements for guitar. And so um, I'm glad that that was uh, useful to you uh, to hear some of the books that I use there. Uh, cool. Another question I got was show a method for absolute beginners to learn. And, you know, the, the method that I learned out of and that I typically recommend that I've taught out of a lot is the Christopher Parkin and Guitar Method Volume 1. It's certainly not perfect, but I find that it works well. So if you're an absolute beginner on classical guitar, a method book like the Parkin and Guitar Method Volume 1 is a good place to start um, just to kind of get that methodical approach. Uh, to get the basics and then go from there. Um, so I have a couple videos on my channel that talk about how I teach beginners with the Parkin and Guitar Method. Um, so I would encourage you to check out the videos on this channel about how to use the Parkin Method if you're looking for a way to get started as an absolute beginner. Uh, so thanks for that question. Uh, now, another question uh, that I'm seeing is from Samir Halapete. I hope I'm saying that name correctly. He says, thanks for taking the time to share these very useful um, suggestions and ideas. I'm having a lot of trouble controlling dynamics between right hand fingers. Are there exercises to help improve it? And Samir, that's a great question. And what I would say about that is that um, I practice thinking of the right hand as if it's a choir, so to speak. Uh, so you've got your bass singer is your thumb and then your tenor is your index finger your um, alto is your middle finger and your soprano is your ring finger. We don't use the pinky as much typically in finger style classical technique. Uh, so when I am uh, playing, um, when I'm playing and thinking about controlling the volume uh, with my right hand, what I would do is just, you know, put thumb on the fourth string, let's say, index on the third and middle on the second and ring on the first and then just start playing, you know, a chord. Kind of doesn't matter what chord, but what I would do is I would practice bringing each finger out in turn. So let's say I want to make the ring finger loud four times, middle finger loud four times, index loud four times, thumb loud four times. So like this. That was the emphasis on the ring finger, now the middle. And then the index. the thumb. And the way that I bring those individual fingers out is by pressing down on the string before I pluck. So I tend to plant on the string, that is to put the finger down on the string before I pluck. And when I plant on the string, I push down a little bit extra with the one that I want to sound loudest. So if I'm going to play louder with thumb, I'm going to push the fourth string down with my thumb a little extra. And then that's going to get the string vibrating wider, creating greater volume and making that thumb louder. Likewise, if I wanted the ring finger to come out louder, then I'm going to push that one down a little bit further when I initially plan on the string and that's going to make the ring finger come out more. Uh, so Samir, good question. I hope that helps with bringing out the individual fingers. Uh, Skeet Joystick says, have you ever tried to use a nail strengthening cream? I tried getting acrylics for classical guitar, but they ruined my nail bed. Yeah, it's true. I've had to use uh, artificial nails before, but they can damage your nail bed. Uh, one thing I liked is there's a product called Rico Nails, and um, it's not really being sold so much anymore, but Rico Guitar Nails, um, I think you can still find the website, even though they're not selling the product as much. But uh, basically, they use glue dots uh, for the artificial nails, and it doesn't damage the nail bed as much. So if you're going to use an artificial nail, that's one option is to use a glue dot um, to secure it, and the glue dot will not damage your nail the way a normal acrylic uh, artificial nail will. Uh, so that's one thought. Another thought, you know, you said, have I used a, a nail strengthening product? Yes, I have. Uh, there was a, a product called Tough Nails that I used to use, and again, I think it went out of business, but there, there are products out there that are like nail hardeners that you just paint on, um, and I would distinguish between like a nail hardener um, that is supposed to help your nail grow better, and then a uh, like a nail polish or something. So I'm not saying like, hey, put on nail polish. I'm saying there are actually products you can paint on the nail uh, that will provide oils and uh, things like that that will help nourish the nail, help the nail to grow. And so, yeah, putting on a product that will help your nail to grow and ultimately get harder over time, I think that's a good thing. And that is definitely something that I've done. 
All right, so if any of you have more questions, feel free to drop those in the chat. Another question I had in advance was from Lauren Jones, and she said, do you have any book recommendation for performance practice on the guitar? And uh, performance practice, uh, what that means is uh, figuring out how people performed in a specific period of history. So in other words, you know, when you say performance practice, some people might just think you mean practicing to perform, but the term performance practice means like how were people using their right hand in the time of Fernando Sor? How were people using their right hand in the time of Gaspar Sanz or, you know, the time of John Doland or whatever. And so uh, there's definitely a, um, a, sort of historical study of how technique was done in different times in history. And so in answer to Lauren's question, I've drawn these things from lots of different articles and resources and uh, you know sources that aren't necessarily specific to guitar. Uh, but I do know there's a book that I don't actually have on this topic. And I think it might be worth checking out, Lauren, if you're really interested in this topic. And that is, it's called Guitar in History and Performance Practice by Anthony Gleiss. I have one of Anthony Gleiss's other books on guitar pedagogy, and I find that's a thoroughly written book. Uh, so it, I think it might be worth checking out his book, History and Performance Practice, um, as well. So History and Performance Practice by Anthony Gleiss. I haven't read it, but just looking at it online, that looks like that would be an interesting book on that topic uh, to kind of pull together info on, on that. But uh, when I've had questions on, you know, how, how was the right hand used in the time of Soar, the time of uh, John Doland or whatever, I've typically, you know, kind of dug in specific articles and uh, maybe books that weren't specifically about guitar and things. But, um, but you know, this question's gotten me intrigued with the Gleiss book. And so, Lauren, if you check it out, let me know what you think. And I'm definitely um, interested that I may check out that book myself uh, because it would be nice to have a place to um, kind of get that sort of historical information in one spot. Um, and Daniel says, when I get to the point that nails or no nails actually makes a difference to my playing, I'll come back to that. Fair enough. Yeah, I understand if you're at a very basic uh, stage of your playing, uh, you may not be so worried with the nails, no nails. And in the early stages, I tell players, don't worry too much about nails versus no nails. Just get used to plucking and playing. And as you get uh, further into it, you may find uh, that you do want to make a distinction about nails versus no nails. Um, and Darshan says, I'm literally watching this on my bed, so I'll have to leave. I know, Darshan, you're in India, and it's a lot later there than it is here. Uh, so thank you for stopping in, and um, I hope you have a great rest of your week, Darshan. So thank you for being here for the stream. And for the rest of you, I'll be on for another 20 minutes, and so love to hear your questions in the chat. And I also have some more questions that were sent in advance uh, that I'll be looking through as well. Uh, so another question in advance was from Brian Gerald. He asked about Alexander technique compared to progressive relaxation. So I've done progressive relaxation. I haven't really done Alexander technique, but I have friends who've done Alexander technique, so I can talk a little bit about comparing the two. So progressive relaxation is basically tensing and releasing each muscle group um, to get rid of tension in your body. So in other words, you might tense your shoulders and then relax them and then tense your biceps and relax them and then tense your hands and relax them. Um, you know, tense your chest muscles and relax them, tense your abs and relax them. You know, in other words, you're tensing and releasing uh, every muscle group in your body. And the idea is to notice the difference between tension and release and relaxation. And this was sort of developed by a psychologist named Edmund Jacobson. And so it's sometimes called Jacobson relaxation technique. Uh, but basically, the idea of pro progressive relaxation is a lot of people aren't aware of how much tension they have in their body. And so by doing the progressive relaxation, you become aware of this. So when I was in grad school, uh, I had a class on dealing with performance anxiety, and the professor actually assigned us to do progressive relaxation every day for 30 days. And it's basically, you, you can find videos that guide, you know, some of the videos that guide you are a little weird. You know, it's like, hey, I'm by all these candles and, you know, like meditating and stuff. And I don't know, some of that's not my cup of tea. But the whole idea of tensing and relaxing each muscle group, I think, is a really useful concept. And at the end of 30 days of doing it, I was so much more aware of like, oh, I've got this little spot of tension in my back and I need to relax that. And then I'd be more comfortable when I was playing. So I recommend progressive relaxation. As far as Alexander technique, I haven't personally done it, but I have friends who have. And it's more oriented around posture, you know, getting your back in good alignment and um, 
almost a little bit like uh, a chiropractor would do, you know, aligning the spine, aligning the joints and things like that. And so I've, I've known some musicians who really benefited from that uh, to make sure they have good posture. And so uh, I think that both Alexander Technique and Progressive Relaxation are worth checking out for musicians. I do think they have benefit. Uh, so if you have other questions, drop them in the chat. Um, another question I had in advance was about the word timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E. Um, first of all, how do you pronounce that? Well, timbre, uh, like that. Uh, looks like you might say timber, but it's pronounced timbre. Um, and what does timbre mean? Well, it's sometimes called tone color. And so the way I would describe it is it's aspects of sound that are different from just how loud the sound is and what pitch it is. So in other words, if I play this note, and if I hum the same note, those two things have a different timbre. In other words, you can tell that one is played on guitar and one is hummed, even though they're basically the same volume, they're basically the same pitch. And the reason you can tell a human voice apart from a guitar is timbre. It's these combinations of the way the different sound waves are interacting in that sound um, that makes up the tone color. And so you can tell one instrument from another, even if they're playing the same note at the same volume, because of that timbre. So within the classical guitar, uh, you can get varieties of timbre or tone color, you know, by where on the string you pluck. You know, if you pluck more over the, uh, the fretboard, you'll get a darker tone. If you pluck over by the bridge, you'll get a brighter tone. You know, if you change the angle of your attack, you know, if you're more straight on the string, you get a brighter sound. If you're more oblique to the string, you get a warmer sound. And so the way that you attack the string um, creates differences of timbre or tone color on the guitar. Another question about timbre was, if I listened to a guitar piece played in MIDI format, would the timbre be different than listening to a guitar, um, you know, just recorded uh, acoustically? And the answer is absolutely. A MIDI guitar has a little different timbre. Um, now, people who do MIDI sampling, you know, they try to get it to sound more like a natural guitar. And uh, you know, these days MIDI is pretty good, but still, if you listen carefully, you're going to be able to tell MIDI apart from a regular guitar because, yeah, that timbre or tone color is different. Um, another question about timbre was, um, does a guitar with maybe a 660 millimeter scale length um, sound different than a 630 millimeter scale length? And the answer is a little bit. Yeah, the scale length could influence the timbre. I find the scale length may influence the volume more than the timbre, uh, but there might be a little influence there. Um, now, again, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. But another question I got in advance was specific to scale length. And actually, I got several questions um, about scale length. Uh, one of the questions about scale length is what is scale length? And that is, it's basically the, the distance from the saddle down here on the bridge, this little white part, uh, to the nut, this little white part here. And so it's the vibrating string length. So if you measure from the nut to the saddle, that's your vibrating string length. That's also what's known as your scale length of your guitar. And a lot of times we talk about it in millimeters. Uh, so a standard scale length is 650 millimeters uh, on the guitar. And so um, that's what most guitars are. Now, the question was asked, why would somebody want a longer scale length than standard? Uh, my guitar is actually 664 millimeters, so it is longer than standard scale length. And some people like a longer scale length because they have bigger hands, and so it just makes the frets a little wider, more room for their fingertips. Um, so there is that. I actually don't love the longer scale length because it makes the stretches harder in the left hand, uh, but I just loved the sound of this guitar, fell in love with this guitar many years ago, and have stuck with it, even though I don't love the feel of the stretches. But um, certainly it's going to be easier to play on a guitar that has a shorter scale length. Um, 650 or shorter. Uh, now, another question was, can you tell by the sound if someone's performing on a 630 millimeter scale length or a 658 millimeter scale length? And the answer is, again, the shorter scale length sometimes has a quieter volume. The longer scale length will often have a, um, you know, a, um, a louder volume. So, yeah, a longer scale length may, may have a louder volume, but that's about the only difference you'll notice in sound. Um, you can get a guitar custom made by a luthier in different uh, scale lengths. And I find that the trend right now is toward people requesting shorter scale lengths like 640 or even 635 scale lengths, um, even though the standard 650 is still very popular. 
Uh, this guitar was made in 1980, and at that time, the longer scale links like 664 were more popular, um, but it's kind of uh, you know gone out of fashion to have the longer scale length at this point in time. Um, and another question is, does the longer scale length have more tension? Yes, there's more tension on the string the longer the scale length gets. And so um, it would definitely be a little bit harder to play on a longer scale length uh, guitar. Now, um, another question was asked about the difference between like a three, three quarters scale length and a standard scale length. So three quarters scale length, um, you know, is like 584 millimeters, so significantly shorter. And so somebody that has smaller hands, um, you know, they might want a three quarter size guitar um, and they might want to, uh, to just have that so that it fits their hands and fits their body better, uh, especially a young person or you know, just somebody who's, who's shorter and has smaller hands uh, might like the three quarter size uh, guitar. Uh, so good questions. Uh, now, another topic that comes up sometimes is, you know, how do you warm up with the guitar? And uh, one of my favorite ways to warm up is just to start with P-I-M-A, uh, so thumb, index, middle, ring. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the chat. But um, a lot of times I warm up with thumb, index, middle, ring, just planting on the strings and playing thumb, index, middle, ring. I do group planting of the I-M-A and uh, just try to get very comfortable with that. And I kind of just notice, do I feel like I'm plucking comfortably? Am I, you know, landing on the strings accurately each time? Am I fumbling for the strings? I just want to get very comfortable when I sit down with the guitar on P-I-M-A. Then I reverse it. I do A-M-I-P, where I do sequential planting, just putting one finger on the string at a time. Uh, so A-M-I-P, and then I do it again, A-M-I-P. And then I might uh, just do P-I-M-A-M-I-P. And then in the left hand, when I'm warming up, a lot of times I'll do like one, two, three, four, um, you know, just playing up uh, the left hand fingers. And then I might come back down, four, three, two, one. Um, and then I might combine the two, one, two, three, four, three, two, one. When I do the one, two, three, four, I'm leaving the fingers down as I go. When I do four, three, two, one, I'm taking each one off as I come back down. You know, once I've done that, once I've uh, kind of warmed up both hands a little bit, then I might try something like just a basic scale. I might start with one octave so I don't have to worry about shifting, um, just like a one octave C major. Uh, once I feel good about the synchronization of my hands uh, for the one octave, then I might go to a two octave. So I would use scales a little bit to warm up. Sometimes I even play around the circle of fifths, you know, C, G, D, A, E, B, you know, C major, G major, etc. cetera, uh, playing scales on different notes. And then I'll warm up uh, with a more arpeggio exercise. A lot of times I use Villa Lobos Etude One, um, this exercise, and I'll start very slowly. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fast piece, but to warm up my right hand, I'll just start very slowly planting each finger on the string before I pluck. gradually get faster as I get more warmed up. And then I'll also do, you know, hammer-ons and pull-offs as part of my warm-up to get the left hand more warmed up. Uh, so I might do just like one, two, and then two, three, two, three, and then three, four, I'll do extra because three, four is harder. And I might kind of do that up the neck. And then as I come back, then I uh, would do the pull-offs, and again, I do 4-3 extra because it's harder. And once I've done that, once I've kind of warmed up with my scales, my arpeggios, my slurs, uh, then I might play a cymbal piece, and I might just take something that I know really well, um, you know, could be uh, like a Carcassi study, for example. Um, and I'm glad that mistake happened just there. Uh, if I notice something like that, then that's a sign like, hmm, I'm not as warmed up as I should be if I'm kind of fumbling on a note. So I might go back and just kind of work that chord shift, make sure I don't fumble a note. Ah, 
that feels better. You know, and just kind of work that a little bit at a time, um, just getting comfortable with, um, you know, my kind of warm up and connection with the guitar. And then I go about my practice session. And then typically the next thing I would do in my practice session is um, I would usually dive into whatever's my focus piece for the day. So if I have a particular piece that I wanna focus on, uh, then after I'm warmed up, I go straight into that piece. Um, so for the last few weeks, I've been working on the English Suite by John Dwart. So that might be my focus piece for the day. And so I'd dive in and I'd practice that for you know, a good 45 minutes, hour, you know, however long I'm gonna practice that. Then I might go and just run through pieces toward you know the later part of my practice session that I already have under my fingers well, uh, pieces that I know really well, you know, Bolobos Prelude One or Asturias or Capriccio Arabe or whatever. Um, you know, I would run through those pieces and just keep them under my fingers uh, later on in the practice session. Uh, now, another question that I get is about the left hand, you know, kind of what is my um, checklist for left hand positioning? And I think about keeping the left hand wrist straight, the fingers curved, uh, the active fingers, those playing at a given time close to the fret wire, the inactive fingers, the ones that are not playing um, at a given time, I keep those close to the neck and I keep the left hand thumb uh, behind the fingerboard supporting the pressure basically between the index and middle fingers. Um, I see Gord says, I see Lagrima is your latest video. How do you pronounce it? Lagrima or is it Lagrima? It's a great question. Uh, so there's actually an accent over the first A. So it's Lagrima, not Lagrima. I've definitely heard people say it the other way. But again, because of the accent on the first syllable, uh, Lagrima. And, you know, it's tricky in classical guitar music. Uh, there's so many different um, nationalities of pieces. It's hard to kind of keep up with all the pronunciations. But Lagrima, which is Spanish, uh, does have that accent over the first syllable. Thank you for that question, Gord. I see New Plato says, how do you shift in the descending C major scale? Is it possible to demonstrate very, very slowly? Sure. And he says specifically in the descending uh, C major scale. So I'll do both ascending and descending. So when I shift in the ascending, you know, I, I play this third finger note and then I shift my first finger up there. Um, then on the way back down, which is what he's asking, then after the first finger, then I shift down and get my third finger there. So I'm using the Segovia fingering, which is what I would describe as a strict position fingering. In other words, everything here is in the second position. That is, everything is aligned with my first finger on the second fret, second finger, you know, above that, third finger above that, fourth finger above that. So this is a strict uh, position fingering. And then when I go here, now I'm in fifth position. And then as soon as I'm done in fifth position, I go right back to second position. Um, and so I'm basically just shifting from the first finger here to the third finger there. That is the shift. And I see Daniel says he has the same question as new Plato. So hopefully you can kind of see that's the shift I'm doing. Now, there are other possibilities. You know, some people will do this shift as like, you know, one, three, four, four as they shift up. And that's not a strict uh, position, you know, fingering. Some people will do four, two, one, and then slide the one going back down. <coughs> so there are different ways to finger it. But if you do the standard Segovia way, which is second position to fifth position and back, uh, then that's what I would do. I'm just on the first finger and then I go to the third finger there. So does that answer your question, New Plato? If not, um, feel free to drop a clarifying question in the chat. Um, if anybody else has a question, uh, feel free to drop that in the chat. I've got about five minutes left in the stream and I really appreciate you joining. Um, if you haven't subscribed, by the way, I'd love to have you just pluck the subscribe button gently and also pluck the like button so this video can spread to more people and uh, really appreciate you supporting the channel by subscribing and liking this uh, video. So um, another topic uh, that I will talk about is um, playing scales around the circle of fifths. I was mentioning that earlier. And so you, you can definitely do that with the Segovia scales. Uh, sometimes I think it's nice to do it uh, simplified, especially if you're not comfortable with all the Segovia scale fingerings. And so one way to do it kind of simplified is to just do two octave G major like this all in one position. And so you can do the Segovia C major, you can do that two octave G major, then you can do a two octave D major uh, using the Segovia fingering, then you can do a two octave A major uh, using the um, 
you know, the fingering I was just demonstrating in one position, then the two octave E major, then the two octave B major in one position, then you can jump down here for F sharp, then up here for C sharp or D flat, and then, um, then A flat, then E flat, B flat, F, and you're back around to C, the beginning of the circle of fifths then. So that's a way that sometimes I'll play through the circle of fifths, all the major scales, just using two octave majors. Um, I see Gord says, how can I get motivated to practice my guitar every day? I would like to be thinking that I can hardly wait to pick up my guitar. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. And one of the things that we don't talk about enough is uh, we don't talk about enough maintaining our motivation. You know, sometimes in guitar circles, it's just like, you know, how can I shred? How can I play really fast? How can I play something really cool? But we forget that sometimes in that quest to play fast, to play the cool piece, you know, that we actually get frustrated. And then when we get frustrated, we start to get demotivated and like, oh man, I remember what a tough time I was having with that piece. I'm not sure I wanna play guitar today. Um, so I think it's important to think about managing our own motivation. And so part of what I would say is just thinking about why do I want to play guitar? You know, I want to play guitar because I enjoy it. I want to play guitar to glorify God. I want to play guitar to share music with other people. You know, all of us have different reasons that we play guitar. And so why am I playing guitar? That's a good question to ask. Uh, but then also um, just noticing how you feel while you're playing. You know, am I enjoying this? If I'm not enjoying playing, why am I not enjoying it? Is there something I could change in the way I'm approaching my playing that would make me enjoy it more? And uh, one of the things I would say is saving some things you really enjoy playing till toward the end of your day of practice is good. So, you know, if one of the last things I play is a piece that I play super well and I enjoy that, then I kind of go away from the guitar like, man, that was a good feeling. Um, I just nailed that when I walked away from the guitar. And that kind of good feeling persists when I think about the guitar the next day. Oh man, remember how good it felt when I ran through Asturias or whatever it was, you know, at the end of my practice session, that's gonna make me wanna pick up the guitar again. As opposed to if you end the session and the very last thing you do is play a hard passage that you don't play well and you just come away from the guitar like, man, I'm just not a good guitarist, what is going on? Well, when you think about picking up the guitar the next day, that's what you're going to be thinking. So I would encourage you to, at the end of your practice session, play things you play well that you can enjoy playing, end on a high note, and that's going to make you a lot more motivated to pick up the guitar the next day. Um, the three maybes, uh, first ever message in the chat. So welcome. Um, the water's fine. Thank you for diving into the chat. Um, and I, it says, just started playing guitar, still pretty new to finger picking in classical style. Seems a very fulfilling one though. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the nice thing about playing finger style and classical is you can play lead guitar, rhythm guitar, and bass guitar all at the same time on one instrument. And I think that's just really cool. You know, I love traditional, you know, um, acoustic guitar and I love, you know, electric guitar, lead guitar. Those are all great things. Uh, but what I think is unique again about classical finger style is you can play the lead rhythm and bass all at the same time on the same instrument. And I just find that to be a whole lot of fun. So I'm glad you're learning the guitar and uh, just, you know, keep making music. There's a lot of fun music in the world to explore. Uh, of course, classical finger style is my personal favorite, uh, but there's a lot of other stuff out there as well. So I appreciate you guys tuning in for the stream today. Um, again, if you wouldn't mind plucking the like and subscribe button, that would be awesome. I'm about to wrap up the stream for today, uh, but I typically do this every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. So I'd love to have you join the next stream. And uh, I just enjoy answering your questions about the guitar. So thanks again for tuning in. Keep making music and I'll see you in the next one.